Sandy Barrett. I'm here with John Franco. I'm here on behalf of the Vermont Institute of Community and International Involvement and bringing you an update about many important issues that are facing our nation and even our city of uh, Vermont, which might not seem to have international reach, but of course we believe it does and it does in a lot of ways. And with me today is John Franco, who is an attorney in Burlington and has been an attorney in Burlington for a long time. And he's here to give us an update about all the legal ramifications of the lawsuits involving the developer of the downtown, downtown mall, which has turned into a big hole, as we all know. And he has been the lawyer for a bunch of plaintiffs who are suing the city about that. And also he's going to talk about the recent lawsuit involves the city suing the developers. So when you talk about two lawsuits that are going on yeah. right now, could you explain that to our community? Let me, before I do that, let's go back, let's go back in time to a time a long, long time ago, in the 1950s. The part of Burlington where this development uh, now yeah. sits, this hole in the ground now sits, was once upon a time the Italian neighborhood of Burlington. The Italian neighborhood of Burlington was torn down and all the residents were forced to leave their homes as part of the urban renewal uh, program um, that was in the 1950s and 1960s. I think the demolition of that part of Burlington occurred actually in the early to mid-1960s, like 1963, 64, 65 ish Then after that, um, through a lot of fits and starts and a lot of times when there were open uh, lots and land that was not developed for a long time. Finally, what was then known as Burlington Square Mall uh, was put in. That was put in in the mid-1970s, which included a first parking garage downtown. Um, then eventually in the late 1970s or early 1980s, a department store was brought in. It was originally called Porsche's, then it became Filene's, and then it became Macy's. Um, and that whole development in the city, the old urban renewal area, finally built out, completely built out, only in 2003 with the construction of the Hotel Vermont. Now think about that. That part of the city went from the demolition of the 1960s to 2003 before it was built out. There was times, decades, where there were huge areas of lots where people used to live with the areas torn down and it wasn't built on. So that's kind of been the history of, uh, of this, this whole urban renewal project. That's really what we're, we're still dealing with. One of the things the urban renewal project tried to do is they tried to reorient commerce in Burlington to run on an east-west direction from Church Street down to Battery Street. That's how the old mall was oriented as opposed to the um, historical uh, configuration of commerce going up and down Church Street on a north and south basis. And so this was an effort to try to change that in the redevelopment downtown. Um, Wait a minute, so what about the streets? Can I tell you about streets? Connection? Okay, that's, that's a good point. The um, Champlain Street and St. Paul Street originally ran as part of a grid in downtown Burlington. It was originally the village of Burlington. Um, and they ran um, through what is now currently the whole within the mall uh, right to um, I believe Pearl Street. And parts of those streets were discontinued as part of this urban renewal area in order to create more developable developable area and to have this east-west connection so that there would be shopping they would draw in shopping from church street down the corridor along bank street and along cherry street um and that design if you if you remember it it was an indoor mall which was the very much de rigueur particularly in the 1970s a lot of cities in northern climates like montreal and uh, minneapolis had uh indoor downtown mall so that people could shop and walk for blocks without having to go outside in the elements and so that was the whole that was the whole theory of of that development wasn't minneapolis the largest mall in the world that's a different mall that's not that's the downtown easy. mall i'm right. talking about right. i'm talking about the malls that connected particularly in montreal that connected yeah. a lot of the downtown areas and also with the metro so you could go in the metro and you could go to an area you could walk from place to place without having to go up and pull that was the whole that was the whole theory of this of this thing in fact i think one of the original owners and developers of the company called Bondo, yeah. out of montreal i think there were a number of montreal developers and there was a whole uh there were a whole host of developers that had come and gone um, in the urban renewal area that at various times owned 
the shopping mall or the, uh, on the parking garage uh, type of uh, and there, there's always, you know, they're always asking for more and more from the city. There's always this kind of tension or, or, or job owning that was going on about what was going to happen uh, down uh, with the development. So, for example, the old parking garage, which was torn down in 2018, was originally built on land that was owned by the city of Burlington. And then the city leased the land so that the developer would then build the actual structure. So it was really kind of a hybrid relationship. And part of that lease was all these conditions about having to serve the public, having to be open at certain periods of time, having to be, having to be open to what's called uh, uh, transient parking. That's the term for people that just come in on an occasional basis and, uh, and use the facility. So that was the whole model. And the, that was the whole urban renewal thinking. Um, let's then fast forward to about 20, oh gosh, 2012, 2014. I think it was in in that period of time that Don Senex's company called BTC Mall Associates and uh, Devon Wood de uh, Developers bought the mall property. Um, and then in 20... Okay, the mall as it existed yeah, the then. The mall that existed then. If people remember the day when you had to have every shops in there, you still had Macy's was still... He didn't own Macy's, but it was connected to Macy's. You had everything from... Uh, uh, oh, gosh. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the stores. Uh, Want me to tell you? Yeah. <laughs> You're going to tell me so they can hear it. Between tear cutting places, two nail places, there was, um, no, 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 I'm going blank, but there, Food court. There, there was Chico's, there was Pottery yeah. Barn. There Pottery was, Barn, that's what I was saying, yeah. Um, yeah. So many. Yeah. Um, right. Right. Um, yeah. Right. Most of them were, most of these were, most of these were, uh, you know, chain, national chain retail outlets. You have some locally owned businesses, you had the locally owned businesses, and then there was a food court downstairs. I think that's still there. That's the part of the mall that hasn't been torn down. Maybe not. Okay. But no long time since I went in there. But Don Cynix, his companies bought up this property. Does Don Cynix have his own company at that time? Oh, I don't know those details. Okay. Burlington Town Center LLC was, was a business entity that he had an ownership interest is whether he owned all of it or some of it, I don't know. Those the Brookfield was not involved no, at that point. That's, that's okay. that's so he bought, or his companies bought this property. And you should have to keep in mind it also included the property that wasn't torn down, the part of the mall that exists from what is supposed to be the extension of St. Paul Street to Church Street, and also the building that L.L. Uh, Bean is in. And there's some offices in there. That's also part of the property. That wasn't torn down, but part of the property. So he bought this around 2012, 2013, and then announced in 2014 he was going to do this major redevelopment of this project. And it was this grand, uh, this grand thing. It was 14 stories. It was going to have originally it was going to have theaters and movie houses and supermarkets and daycare centers and art centers and housing and retail. And the and, hospital, right? Well, no, the hospital offices. They were going to have yeah. the offices there. So it was all this great, um, great project. It was going to be a 14-story project that they were going to do. It's supposedly going to be a quarter of a billion dollar investment, $250 million. And um, they got the city. It was going to be two very important roles to the city. Um, they needed to get what's called TIF financing, and I'll talk about that in a minute. They also needed to get the zoning ordinance changed so they could go up to 14 stories. The zoning ordinance that had just been adopted in the city plan I think it was limited to 10 or 11 or 12 stories. So they were they were going to go above that. So um, the long and the short of it is they got a uh, they got a uh, an amendment to the zoning ordinance. It was called an overlay uh, zone uh, proposed. Uh, and it was submitted to the voters during the 2016 presidential election. It was approved. Uh, so it gave them the ability to go to, to, to increase the, uh, the height. The other part of it was the they wanted the city wanted to reestablish the old Pine uh, old St. Paul Street and Pine Street and to connect them uh, from from Bank to Cherry and to do some other public amenities and those were going to cost twenty two million dollars and this is a really important point the way that it was going to be paid for was through something called tax increment financing. The way tax increment financing works is that the property tax revenues that are generated yeah. by the project 
rather than being paid into the education fund and the city general fund, at least for their short term, are paid to pay off the public improvements for the development. Right. So the idea is the property taxes don't pay for the public improvements of the development. And they had to go to the legislature and they had to get an amendment to the tax increment a financing district for uh, Burlington. It was actually an extension of the waterfront district. It had some pretty strict limitations on it. It only allowed the TIF financing, the property uh, tax increment to come from the buildings that were being built on that development. It couldn't include any of the other uh, waterfront properties. I mean, it also had to be built within a certain time period. And I think the last payment on it had to be made no later than June 30th, 2021. What happened? Well, let, let me, okay. so to make the TIF financing work to pay off the $22 million, that was one of the reasons they said it had to be this big project, this big 14 story project with all these, with all these, uh, all these things. Now, the, probably the big objection uh, by uh, the various members of the community was that the thing was oversized, it was too big for downtown Burlington, it was out of scale. And many of us felt that it just wasn't going to be uh, financially viable. Of anyone. Can I interrupt for a minute? Yeah. With, in our audience is Barbara McGrew and both Jack Daggett, who were plaintiffs, I believe, in the case, in the original case, right? That was brought. Not were. They are still they are. because the case is ongoing. But I just did want to mention and thank them for being here. And maybe after John finishes, or now, if you have any questions. It would be great if you could ask those questions, okay? But anyway, go ahead, John. So what happened, what happened was the, um, it was a great segue, actually. This group of people, there was a group of petitioners, Barbara and a couple of other individuals brought various, and you were one of the petitioners, brought various legal challenges to this project. There was an, we, the Development Review Board in Burlington gave it a zoning permit. That was appealed to the Environmental Division. There was a challenge that was brought to the TIF financing. There was a claim that they didn't comply with various procedures that were required for legal TIF finance. Uh, Barbara brought a claim that this also, in addition, needed an Active 50 permit. And there was also a demand that the uh, the feasibility study that was done for the project be fully disclosed to the public. It wasn't fully disclosed to the public, only parts of it were disclosed to the public. Part, it was fully shared with the city council, but the whole thing was never made public. Uh, key among the things that was never disclosed was part of the feasibility study that talked about the cost of the project, what the estimated construction cost of the project was there. Now that's very important because what ended up happening was that, um, well, let me hold that thought. It ended up not being viable. Uh, to try it's to financially back viable. Fi financially viable. All those cases were settled in a global settlement that uh, we reached with the developer in July of 2017. After that, the developer then got a development agreement with the city of Burlington to iron out what the responsibilities were regarding this TIF financing and the reestablishment of these streets and the public improvements. That agreement was entered into in October of 2017, and then shortly thereafter, the city went ahead and gave the developer permission to begin the demolition of the part of the old mall and the old parking garage. Uh, as it turned out, the developer didn't have all the things it was supposed to have but in the development true. agreement, no, not true, mm -hmm. um, to begin the demolition. Um, okay, I'll come back to that later. Um, there are certain things in the development agreement that were supposed to have that they didn't have, but the mayor let him go ahead and begin the demolition anyway. So the demolition started in, it was either November or December 2017. The demolition was completed in about, I think, July of 20, uh, 2018. But then everything came to a screeching halt. And then when we were told there wasn't any money left. Now I've got to backtrack about what happened. The, uh, the development agreement provided that the developers were supposed to, and this is where Devin Wood, uh, not Devin Wood Associates, but uh, uh, okay. Brookfield Associates came in through a subsidiary. And they were partnering with Don Senex's company, and they were putting in about $55 million in equity financing. And then the balance was supposed to be obtained through bank financing. And the development agreement with, that was signed with Burlington in October of 2017 said the developers would put up this $56 million, and they would make an effort to get equity financing by March of 2018. Well, the first mistake was on both parts, the developer's parts and the city's part. 
is they allowed the demolition to start before they had bank finance. Well, then come to find out, they were having problems getting bank financing because this thing was actually basically, as, the, as I said, it took the bankers to tell these guys what the hippies were telling them. This thing was too big, it was overpromised, and it wasn't going to work. Wait a minute, so the bank told that? Yeah, they couldn't get financing. The bank said, we can't see how this is going to work. And they were shopping all over. <clears throat> they finally ended up with a bank called the Bank of the Ozarks, which, oh, right, was, right. which was supposed to be their best shot at getting financing, but they ultimately couldn't get financing from them. One of the problems, as it turned out, was that um, the company that had the mortgage on the existing mall was an insurance company out of Indianapolis, decided to call the note. And they, let me tell you about call, why they called the note. They had the mortgage that allowed Don Sennex to acquire these properties, whatever it was, in 2012. The properties that were being demolished was the security for the mortgage. The income from the rents on those stores that they closed were security for the mortgage. The land was security for the mortgage. So when they started doing the demolition, they were demolishing the, the security and the collateral on their existing mortgage, which was, <coughs> excuse me, about 23 million bucks. So. 56 million is the number. They had some pre-development costs. They spent about 20, 25 million dollars on the demolition. It was four, four thought life insurance company out of Indianapolis calls the note, and they had to come up with 23 million dollars in cash to pay the note off. The note was paid off in July of 2018, which is the Who time. Paid it off? Don Sinex in Devon. Oh, okay. I mean, in the Brookfield. So all of a sudden, in June, the cupboard's bare. There's no more equity capital and they don't have financing. So then they went to the city and they tried to get some amendments to the agreement and they said, if you give us these amendments, we'll start work on the ground floor. That never materialized. And then finally, about a year ago in November of 2019, Brookfield sent a detailed letter to um, the mayor and I think it's also the Betsy, which was the state agency that was dealing with the, the TIF financing, saying that we can't get financing they were then talking about downsizing the project at that, at that time, but they said the downsizing of the project will not generate enough property taxes in order to finance the TIF to do these public improvements. So then, uh, wow. so okay, so this is sort of the cascade of things falling apart. Um, one of the things they did, and one of the reasons we were in court and are in court, in order to try to make this project more viable, the developer in the city unilaterally amended our settlement agreement that we had entered into in environmental division, which we had required them to put in a certain level of parking and do some other things. So they, they gutted a major portion of the parking requirement. They never told us about it. They did it behind our back and told us it was an administrative amendment. Uh, and we tried to challenge that federal court. We weren't, we weren't successful in doing that, by the way. We ended up losing that. Um, and they were doing other things like adding certain amenities. They were going to put a gymnasium with some health facility on the roof and put in a couple of swimming pools. So they were trying to reduce the cost and increase, I think, the marketability or the, the attractiveness to developers about how much money this was going to raise. That occurred during the 28, excuse me, the 20, yeah, the 2018 mayoral race. The, it was sort of like the mayoral race is going on over here and it's a diversion. And they quietly do this administrative amendment through and don't tell anybody about it. And so they cut. I forget how much they cut the parking by. It was like 40% or something like that. So we, we screamed bloody murder about that. But that wasn't good enough. It still couldn't get the financing from uh, the Bank of uh, Bank of the Ozarks or anybody else. And so then finally in November of uh, last year, they sent a letter to the city saying, this just this, this thing just isn't viable. It isn't, the original plan isn't going to be viable, and we've got to downsize the thing. Um, then Brookfield went around with a reduced plan for, I think, um, 11 stories. They were calling it 10, but actually with mechanical, it was 11. It was um, housing uh, much reduced, no, no, virtually no offices in the uh, in the new proposal and uh, what was supposed to be offices, I think they, then they proposed to put in a hotel. And that idea was put in a couple of times. They had a special city council meeting last fall where they proposed that and then they had another uh, uh, presentation to uh, the immediate neighbors, from neighbors in it was late February, it was right before the pandemic broke out, um, where they were talking about this. But a lot of people were getting the sense that Brookfield's heart wasn't really in it, and they were they weren't. The city wanted to negotiate a new development agreement, and they weren't getting responses and so forth and so on. So anyway, what happened? And then fast forward to this month in September, 
finally, um, Cynics, uh, Cynics announced that Brookfield was getting out. They were selling out their interest, and that, um, at least the way uh, Cynics put it, they have now completely abandoned the project that was permitted uh, by the Development Review Board by the develop by the uh, Environmental Division uh, in 2017. They've completely abandoned that. Uh, so it's a big hole. So that's what they've been saying. Now, then we can. So well, we've had the big hole. So then that brings us to the mayor's lawsuit. So, so do you want me to stop there? Yeah, stop there and see if there are any questions. Anybody have any questions or thoughts thus far? I do. So that has the project been completely abandoned by the developers? The project as approved in 2017 has been abandoned by the developers. Is there any new proposals? There was a, call it a demi proposal of what I talked about, which was a lower, uh, not as high project. Um, they also cut the parking some more and they put in a hotel. But that never, uh, they never filed any permits for that, never filed for any permits. And then that, even that's now been pulled. So they everything's off the table. Uh, and they, what they're saying, at least in these letters that they sent to the mayor, right before Labor Day, is that they're going to start from scratch. And they've got. Who's going to start from scratch? The Cynics, and he's got some new partners, which are local developers. Um, somebody from, uh, uh, from SDI. SDI. Ireland. Uh, uh, and Farrington or something? Dave Farrington. But is that still um, even consi being considered? Well, they don't have a particular proposal because what the mayor said is the mayor was claiming that he did not want Cynics involved right. in, this pro in this project and he was going to sue to keep Cynics down. And? And, he, and well, and and he was going to try to force Brookfield to stay in it. Okay. Uh -huh. And he accused them of fraud and all these other things. But that's part of his now lawsuit, correct? Well, I was going to get to okay, that. Okay, go ahead. So, the lawsuit they filed, they filed this in Chittenden Superior, to, or Vermont Superior Court in Burlington, uh, the day after Labor Day. 117 pages. It's a 117 page lawsuit. It doesn't really say we're trying to. And what is it? It's a suit. By... I'm going to try to explain that, Sandy. Okay, it's not, it's, it's, it's not, it's not an effort to. doesn't say that Devin Wood has to stay in. What they're trying to claim is that because the developers began construction by demolishing the old yeah. wall, they have to build the public improvements no matter what. Even if they couldn't get financing, they have to build them. On their own. Even if the project isn't viable, they have to build it. And now they're claiming, in addition, they're going to have to do it even without any public subsidy from the city. So this is their, as we call it in the legal business, <coughs> their theory of the case. And it goes something like this, and I think this is really amazing. The old project, which was 14 stories tall, involved $250 million and required a $22 million public subsidy. wasn't feasible. Now the city is going to go in and ask a superior court judge to order a developer who uh, can only build a smaller project and who hasn't been able to get financing to nevertheless go forward and build these public improvements without any public public financing on its own dime and somehow that's going to make this project viable. Oh my God. That's his theory. Now, uh, I can, I don't know if I want to bore the audience with the glory details about why I think that that, that whole theory is, 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 to say the least, a well, stretch. Don't, don't they think that Brookfield has enough money to do it on their own if they want to do it? That wasn't what the agreement said. What the agreement said is they had to make an effort and they had to sort of show that they had $56 million worth of equity financing, which they had. And I think they spent, after you get done paying off uh, for, for thought the life insurance, I think they, in doing the demolition, they had more than that in it. So I think they could probably show that they fulfilled that. And they made a good faith effort to get financing. It doesn't, they just couldn't get it. And so the question is, what, and this is right in there. It talks about in, in the uh, in the agreement about what the uh, development agreement, what the time frame, the completion time frame would be. It talks about things that are in control of the city and the developers. Well, the inability to get financing was not in their control. Um, and uh, it, it, again, it only required the developers to show that they had the equity financing and to make an effort to get the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, bank financing. But it didn't say if you can't get it, you still got to go forward. Anyway, this idea that Devonwood is a big, not Devonwood, the Brookfield is a big deep pocket, and the court can order Brookfield to come back and do this out of its own funds above and beyond the $56 million, I, I just honestly don't see a court remotely ordering that kind of a thing. 
So then what? Well, what's the purpose of the lawsuit then? That's the sixty-four dollar question. I really, I, I don't know if if the city is thinking that somehow they can just wait these guys out or hold these guys up, and that Don Cynics will throw in the towel and, and? leave the project. I, I, I originally that was was the mayor said his objection was he did not want to do deal with Don. And he wanted to keep Brookfield in this, but the other thing is that uh, a couple of things. This is this is private property. This is a private investment. I can't see how a city can tell a, a partner in a partnership that they can't sell out their interest and they've got to come back and they've got to finance a project out of their own pocket even though they can't get finance. I don't see that as being like uh, And uh, so uh, I, the question is what they're up to. I, I just well, really don't. Who is I, up to the city? The city is up to. I just don't know what the end, what the end, uh, what the end result is. You know, it's just going to. I mean, some some people and some of the commentators are going to say it's maybe just a negotiation ploy. But uh, I mean, Brookfield's out, and I had the sense that Brookfield was just going to cut their losses and get out. And frankly, a year ago, there were a number of people in Burlington that are in the so, development community were saying the same thing. Yeah. They were predicting. They yeah. said, "I think in a year, Brookfield's going to be out. I mean, uh, Dublin, it, Brookfield's going to be out. They're just going to cut their losses. They, this is like a this is like a bottomless pit. They don't want to throw good money after bad. They're just going to get out. They probably." Out of the loss, they probably took a loss of this thing, but they're investing. They, they, they sold their interest. I think what happened to this thing. Yeah, I'm very. So they are now on the hook for the development. No, they're not on the hook because it's they're not on the hook for anything. Yeah. So what did they buy? What did they buy then? I think they. I think they. I think they're contributors to a new partnership, but they've got a new partnership. There's a name for it. That's now going to be the new developer. But the, the idea that the idea that um, and the other thing is I think is the idea that the city is going to force Don Cynics out. I mean, look at I'm in litigation. We're in litigation. I don't care what you're going to do. I'm going to prevent Don from doing this, and I'm going to force Brookfield back in. I mean, look at I've seen crazier things come out of the courts, but I don't see certainly don't see the Vermont Supreme Court ordering that. And I don't see the Vermont Superior Court ordering. That. Jack's got a question. Uh, the three partners are all contractors. Right. Sense is that they want to try and recover some of the money that's owed to them. Owed to them? Yeah. No. I, I don't think so. No. I think they've all been paid. They wouldn't go near this. That they wouldn't. I don't think any of the, anybody would get into a business like that or intend to see it getting paid. I'm sure that before this happened, all the people that were owed money, those those things were all settled, was well resolved. Why are they doing? It? Because they think they can make money on it. Yeah. They think they can put in a project that it's going to work. Right. A further downsized project. We're talking about primarily housing. A little bit of retail. That's what they're talking about. They've got the hotel, the pandemic, bye-bye with the hotel. I mean, look what's happened to the hotel and the airline industry. Look what's happening to the to the uh, tourism industry. I mean, that's... I look what's happening to Burlington, Vermont. Vermont. What? What, what are they going to do with that? I think they're also in a partnership with that as well. Uh, that and they said that this is an actual partnership. This is not a proposed partnership. It's happened that they finance uh, Dave Farrington, uh, Ireland. And, uh, guy from Ireland, and this is their guy from uh, uh, forget the name. so um, I only knew Ireland and Farrington, yeah. So, the, the you know, the, the pundits are just wondering what the upshot of this 117 losses would be other than just a lot more delay in getting this thing done. Don Cynic said that uh, Brookfield, Brookfield's advice was to sit on this thing for five years to see how things were going to shake out. In the they, weren't, they weren't comfortable investing in anything in, in, in much of anywhere, but particularly here. <laughs> I guess they just didn't know what the economics of downtown Burlington were going to be. You know, what's going to work? Is it going to be housing? Is it going to be hotels? Uh, what's going to happen with shopping? Are people going to continue to work from home? Uh, what's the market for office space going to be? Exactly. Those are real. Exactly. Everything's been thrown up in the air. Right. I mean, as I say to people, um, it's sort of like arguing in 1945, the issues that were on the table in 1939, except that you had a world war in the middle. And it used to be Britain and France that were the two world powers. And you came out of that, and, uh, excuse me, Britain and, uh, and France and Japan were two world powers. And you came out of that war, it was in the United States and the Soviet Union. And by the way, we're dragged in involuntarily. So um, the whole world is upside down.
and that was that was uh, allegedly Brookfield's thinking, but I, you can pretty much tell that that's what they were. That's what was going on. What does this mean for the city of Burlington? What does it even mean politically? You think? I mean, it's, it's going to be a mayor's race in March. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. That's a good question. I just don't know. Because every time I go downtown, I talk to businessmen who say that Burlington is in a serious, serious financial difficulties right now. Is that correct? And is that in this this part of it? Well, without tourism insurance. Well, I mean, let me put it this way. Imagine if Bob Kiss was mayor and he managed to gut the commercial heart of downtown Burlington, right, including gone. the mall, the parking garage, and Macy's. Uh, Ernie Parmo would be putting the gallows up in front of City Hall for the hanging. Uh, this is what's happened to our downtown. Yeah. So, what the political want to try to do? You know, you've got other issues going on now, obviously, in Burlington or East gathering yet they're getting more attention so uh, with Black Lives Matter. What so. is the status of our suit and how relevant is it now? How what? How relevant is it Oh, it's very relevant. I mean, look, at, um, I think it's now going to take a back seat to this. I think they're going to be focusing their attention on the suit of the city. But, I mean, I think their suit against us is just ridiculous and eventually out, but uh, it's just you know we're in a discovery process and I'm just waiting for them to do depositions to people to show that there wasn't any violation of the agreement and just done with it. And I have been very good about not criticizing anything going on with that because that's the agreement that we signed. They have violated every single provision of it and then have the nerve to accuse us of violating it. That's the way it goes. Well, Boston. you and Moreau Weinberger now have something in common to say about Don Senex is that he doesn't honor his agreements. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm ashamed that I ever signed that. Well, I think we went into it in good faith. The only, the, there's only one thing they ever did. What our lawsuit is about, by the way, is one of the things they agreed to do was to pay $500,000 to uh, make a charitable contribution and settlement of this thing. And uh, originally it was supposed to be with one or organization, but for a variety of reasons that wasn't working out. So then we decided that we wanted, it was supposed to be, the installation was in two parts, $200,000 initially, and then the other $300,000 for the project was completed. And we they then decided we wanted the $200,000 to go to the Caroline Fund, which is uh, uh, the, uh, the charity that was, has been founded in honor of uh, Sandy's daughter. And uh, they said, no, they weren't going to do it. They've come up with all these cock and bull reasons why uh, they can't contribute the money. I, I suspect the next argument they're going to make is they're going to make the same argument uh, to us that they made to Don Senex is we've abandoned the project. We don't have any more contractual obligation to you. Well, That's the next thing they're going to throw at. Excuse me, but our agreement with the Senate is not with Yeah, but. Right. Our agreement is with BDC yeah. Mall Associates, which is the independent and super city world. So you gotta, you gotta get behind. It's like who owns who owns the stock in General Motors? It doesn't matter. It's not the stockholders. It's General Motors. General Motors is the entity. Okay. These are these developers: BTC Mall, a Devonwood Associates. Those are the entities that are the developers. The people that might be the partners in those things may come and go. Devonwood was a partner in one of those entities, but they came and went. They sold out their interests. It wasn't like, I mean, not Devonwood Brookfield. It wasn't like Brookfield was a developer. It wasn't like Brookfield was the one that had the permit. It wasn't that Brookfield was the one that had the contract with the city. It wasn't that Brookfield was the one that had the contract with us. Then it's not the way it worked. Moreau's trying to claim that, oh, well, you can look behind the curtain and go after the people that are the owners. I don't believe that. I don't believe that for a minute. Okay, That's, so why did Moreau do this? I think it's to cover his ass for having the screw up. He's trying to look bold and assertive and. Um, my, when I heard of this thing, I said, Moreau Weinberger is the other side of co-conspirators. And the reason for that is he allowed them to begin demolition of the project in December of 2017. What they, were, they needed to have is not only $55 million in equity, which I think they showed them, they needed to have contracts, written contracts in place for environmental work, site work, and foundation. They didn't have contracts for any of those. And they allowed them to go forward with the demolition. Right. Well, keep in mind, yes, but contractually, they were only obligated to be financed or financed. He didn't say you had to have the finance, which, by the way, was really stupid. 
It should have said you got to have the finance. That was really, that was also a very big, but so that's why, but even based upon the agreement they had, Moreau didn't enforce his own. And now he's complaining about, oh, they went ahead and demolished the wall. Well, no kidding. You let them do it. You had the ability. Keep in mind, they began their work less than a month after the development agreement was signed. So the, the ink wasn't, do you think they screwed us? The ink wasn't drawn in the development agreement that began to ignore. Mayor began to ignore. Developer began to ignore. The city's rationale on that, you know, why they should have did that, is that it would be better to have a demolished place to deal with than, than that old stuff. I bet you the developers right now will wish they had a still functioning 567 space parking garage that maybe required a rehab, but not a complete reconstruction. And that would completely change the economics of what they have to do in this area. Totally. Totally. I can tell you firsthand that that wall might have been underperformed. It was not failing. Right. going to stay. There were three dozen stores in there that were working. Civics systematically forced them out. And the rents from those things were the security for the mortgage and for forethought life insurance of Indianapolis, Indiana had. And that is the, I, I was, I've been trying to get the media to cover that story for, I have a theory about why they couldn't get financing that I'm not going to actually repeat publicly, but um, I think it, I think the key of why this thing went down was that. You want to know why this thing failed um, was that there was a $23 million mortgage for the existing mall nobody accounted for. And that sucked up half the equity investment in this thing. So they didn't have, once they got the demolition done, they had no money to go for. Yeah. I have another question, John. What was the big thing about even I look at it, it's going to cost, cost even more than they said it was going to cost. We've lived with it for the past how, 20 years or so. 20. What is, what's, 20. What's, what's, 20. 6, 7, 1965. Yeah. So what's, what is the, the big deal about that? Well, it was in Plan BTV. I got to tell you, I am in the minority. I think that was a very bad transit center. <clears throat> so what you get is another block of street that isn't a line. And so I, you know, I, uh, my traffic lawyer, I can't believe that that's going to be a problem. And then the pro the one on Pine Street, in order to make that one, they've got to go under the Burlington Free Press building, underneath and then go up. And I, I got to tell you to anybody, it's not a very attractive looking thing and it doesn't look very safe, particularly if you're a pedestrian or if you're a female pedestrian. Oh, is, it, a lot is it safe for the Burlington Free Press? Yeah, I don't think that's an issue. It's just that it's just what you have to do going under that building, you have to go down and under... And it's, I just don't think, it's just, it's just, it's ugly and it's, I just don't think it's very, it's a very good idea. But, okay, I'm not, I'm not certain about the time we have left, but any other thoughts or what, John, do you have something else in conclusion? I mean, I just, I mean, is it as much of a mess as we suspect? I don't, I mean, no, I guess, I basically came to talk about the, the lawsuit of the city was the developer, and I just don't know, I don't know what the real end game is. I, there's no way I can see that we're going to get more to it. I can see that we're going to get more to it. But Brooklyn will be back. And I don't see a superior court judge ordering a developer to do work with a project which they made a good faith effort to get financing for that they couldn't. And that's in the contract that way, correct? Well, it, it said that they would, they would make an effort to right, get financing. Right. They didn't say that they, they, had, they, had, they had to continue with the project. And it required them to put in 55 million bucks. They did that. Wow. And it didn't work. And I don't see how anybody can order a developer to do something that's not economically feasible, which goes back to our Public Records Act request. The people that were opposing the TIF project in 2017 wanted all the details of the viability of this project. And the one piece of that that they completely redacted and we went, we, we litigated the case. Finally, the, uh, the uh, Coalition for a Livable City was the last remaining plaintiff. They continued with the lawsuit. And we went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, no, nope, you don't get to see that. It's exempted under the Public Records Act as a, as a, as a uh, business trade secret. And so there was no disclosure of the, of the construction cost. And that's what the irony is, is that they wanted the voters to spend $22 million sight unseen on, a, on this project, 
uh, without knowing what the construction costs were, and that was what ended up killing the project that's cost of construction. So there you have it. So um, some people have suggested that it's the bad karma in theory of what's happened. It's that it's their the, the penance they're paying for having uh, eliminated the Italian neighborhood in the 1950s and 60s. Penance. Penance. It's or, or karma. It's just yeah. sort of like when they built the airport in Denver over the Indian burial grounds. They started having all these problems. Yeah. You know, I say it's important for not listening to the community. You know, okay. They just didn't listen. They just accused us of everything. Right. That's the other irony. Oh my God. We were accused. We were accused of holding this thing up because heaven forbid we brought an appeal to the environmental division. We settled that case in 90 days. We had a comprehensive settlement in 90 days. Um, and then when we sought to enforce our agreement, we were accused of holding up the development. Look who's doing it now. Who's actually holding up the development? City Burlington. Okay, so any concluding thoughts? There's the mayor's race in March, and many city councilors also. So I guess we'll see what happens, right? If we're not in civil war over the Trump election. I know, you that know, might be the case. Is, so. I can't do it, but the community should oh, organize okay. and figure out what they want done with that space. Yes, what sure. is their vision? That's what we count on you for, Barbara. Get the community on the okay? Forget about it. I will say that the developers have offered the city of Burlington the property. They have? Yes. Right. They've offered them the property for the roads, and they've, if they want the whole thing, they've offered them the whole thing. Okay. I didn't say that. Oh, okay. So, so Sinex doesn't own it? He does own it. They've offered it to the yeah, city of Burlington. In other words, they, the city they said could if you buy want it, it. Pay, us, buy us, pay, pay us for it. Right. I mean, they'd have to do that if they condemned it under eminent domain. They still have to pay fair market value for it. It's also, as we say, it cuts the dick. It's really nervy for them to say. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, if the city, if the city would could buy it and get a different developer in there. I mean, that's how urban renewal happened. They condemned the property. The city owned it, and then they sold it off to private developers. That's how that was the urban renewal model. So there's nothing terribly new about that idea. They just said, you don't even have to go through the... But the, does the city have the money to do it? Of course not. Right. Well, well, how many, how many unfinished... You want to go through the litany of unfinished projects in Burlington? Southern Connector, Memorial Auditorium, Moran Plant. Need I go on? No, because we are out of time. But we appreciate it. <laughs> so thank you all for coming, and thank you for your questions. And let's thank the St. John's Club yep. for letting us hear in public and oh, yeah. using their land to do this wonderful program with John Franco. So we might see you in a couple of weeks with another program. And thank you for Beth and Lou for filming this. Thanks a lot. <laughs>